Again, the book of Acts, chapter 2. I'll read it to you, or you can read along with me. This is Peter's response to the question that was posed, what is this, after they heard the wonderful works of God in the language of their country? Beginning at verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 15 for the second reading and final reading. There are many other portions that I could read to synchronize with what we're going to be speaking about tonight and what we just read in Acts chapter 2, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just condense it and read two portions here. Beginning at verse 8 of chapter 15. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he says, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I have something to say to you. That's it. Say on. I say that to my church, if you say, say on, that really means you want to hear the word. If I'm telling you I have something to say to you, I hope I mean it. And if you say, say on, I'm hoping that you mean it. Anyway, Brother Tony, thank you for that great message on the rapture. It reminds me of a, a children's song. I don't know if you've ever heard it or sang it, but I love to sing it with the children. It has to do with the rapture. There's going to be a meeting, a meeting in the air, in the sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you there in the land beyond the sky. Such a meeting will be there, never heard by mortal ear. It will be glorious, I do declare. God's own Son will be the leading one in the meeting in the air. Can you say amen? amen. What a meeting that will be in the air, and he will get all the glory at that time. This past week I had an invitation uh, from the town that my church is in, and being a, quote, clergyman, they invited me to do an invocation for uh, a new breed of town councils that they had in the beginning of their new fiscal year, and apparently they select uh, a clergyman from the town to come in and do the invocation. So this was my first opportunity, and I said, absolutely, I'll be there. But I said to myself, boy, I've never done anything like that, prayed in a, in a mixed political crowd like that, and I know some of the political correctness views that are out there, and I said, boy, how am I, you know, I'm always used to praying with Christians, uh, or praying with an unsaved person about Christ very openly and freely, but being in a town hall with uh, all these politicians, the town manager was there, and, and the new nine counselors, that's how the town is run, I thought, maybe I better go on the internet and check it out and see how do they, how, what's an invocation like at, a, at such an occasion. So I did a little Googling and kind of found, found, tried to find out what kind of language is best to use under the circumstances. So I just surveyed it a little bit, and then I decided I would write my own, and I've never written a prayer. I don't know if you other preachers have ever done that. I kind of think it's unnecessary. I mean, we're filled with the Spirit, right? Can't we just pour our hearts out to God? Well, anyway, I figured I'd better write it out just to be sure I hit some of the important points that I thought would be important to state in front of these, uh, this crowd of people. And then when it comes to the end, and this is what I did when I got into the town hall and into the big, uh, the big looked like a courtroom practically, uh, they invited me to come up and pray, and I said, oh, thank you very much, and I uh, 
welcomed some of the new town councils on the board and congratulated them for having been elected. And I said, now let's bow our heads and pray. Well, I went through the prayer that I had written down. I had one eye open and one closed in the way I, I don't think they knew that I was with my left eye looking at what I wrote. But nevertheless, I felt like I wanted to get something out to these people. So I wound up by saying this in conclusion. We pray all these things in the name of the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. And nobody said amen. amen. <laughs> but is he not the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen. Over all mankind, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't disengage the truth that he's still the king, he's still reigning, he's still ruling, he's still on the throne of God, sitting there at the right hand of God. I was talking to my brother last week, and uh, we have a family member that has some addiction, and um, it's concerning, and my brother said to me, my brother's an unbeliever, he would state, I'm not religious, he doesn't go to church, He's not atheistic, he would be more in a, maybe an agnostic category, leaning more towards the belief that there is a God, but really doesn't have any understanding of the personality of God or a relational uh, experience with God at all. Well, anyway, he says, you know, I remember um, a good friend of mine, he's telling me this, who works in the prison system. I think he may be uh, a deputy or something. He says, we're talking about heroin addiction, and it's a big problem up in New England, gigantic problem. Had to do a number of funerals of uh, overdose is, uh, of these young, young men, young women, and it's, uh, it's very, very sad. And he, uh, the, the person in the uh, prison system says, these people, when they're in jail, of course, they're not, they're not using, but in their in jail, because of using or abusing and, or whatever they do, have done with drugs, and then they go back out in the streets and they do it again and they go, get back into pr jail. So it's back and forth, back and forth like a ping pong ball. He says the only ones that don't come back, and this is my brother quoting this guy, he said, it's the ones who find Jesus. And I thought, I said, that's exactly right. Jesus makes a difference in someone's life and he did in mine. I don't know if I would have wound up in jail. I know I would have wound up somewhere where I would not want to admit that I would have been if it were not for the grace of God in saving me and saving you. So praise God that we have a love for the Lord and he has changed our life. You know, in a recent poll that was taken just in the last month or so, it stated that 90% of Americans believe in God. It's actually down from several years ago, about 10 years ago, it was 94% of people believed in God. Now only 90% of people believe in God. But what does that really mean anyway, to believe in God? Well, the demons believe in God. They tremble. Believing in God is not going to save you. Jesus says, and I like to say that to people who say, I believe in God. And I say to them, well, listen to what Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. To believe in God is insufficient, will not result in your conversion or your salvation. Oh, and by the way, I must add, if you're having a problem with my accent, uh, I have a problem with it too. <laughs> and I'll tell you how. I got an iPhone some time ago, one of these iPhones now, you can just talk in it, right? And it just re puts right on the screen what you said. I was trying to get my family members together for a union, a reunion rather, of the family. So I spoke into the iPhone, and I hit the send button, and it says... Let's get together for a party party. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, it said party reunion. Let's get together for a family party reunion. And I said, oh no, do I sound that bad? <laughs> well, I've had to try to adjust my language, but I'm not always successful. So bear with me. Hopefully you'll be able to get the gist of what I tell you. Anyway, we're talking about J David, the son of God, Jesus Christ, who's called the son of David. The, the word David, the name David, appears 54 times in the New Testament. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, says that Peter, uh, rather that David had 
been given to him the revelation that out of his loins one would come who would sit on his throne. And Peter says this occurred at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that is where he is right now. Now, to Gentiles and to the average Christian, that may not be very meaningful that Jesus is on David's throne. It sort of has a Judaic uh, connotation to it. And there it is, and we have to understand how do we re relate to Judaism or to, to the Bible's Old Testament people of God. I was doing evangelism one time in the city that I grew up in, and I was on a busy street corner, and I was handing out tracts, and I handed one to this lady, and she backed off, and she said, I'm Jewish. And I said, oh, I am too. <laughs> and she looked at me skeptically. My hair was a little blonder, and my skin color, or whatever it was, she doubted that I was a Jew. And I said, well, wait a minute. I am. I'm a child of Abraham. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, do you realize what your Bible says, the Torah? It says the promise that God made to Abraham. I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and in your seed, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. How is that? I said, I'm one of the nations to which Abraham was given the promise that his offspring would result in him becoming a father of many nations. I said, I'm a child of Abraham. You're a child of Abraham by nature. I'm a child of Abraham by the Spirit. I'm a spiritual child of Abraham. You're a natural child of Abraham. You need the new birth like I do to be a part of the spiritual family of Abraham's. So let's look for a moment about, uh, about this Davidic throne, Jesus sitting on the throne of David. The similarities between David and Jesus are amazing when you compare David in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New. Let me give you one example of that. David was anointed by Samuel. That was the first time. He was anointed in Hebron. And then thirdly, he was anointed in Jerusalem. Jesus was also anointed three times. Luke 1, 35. The Holy Ghost shall, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was anointed at his conception in the womb of Mary. And then at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and God says, this is my Beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The second anointing. When was the third anointing of Jesus? Right here in Acts chapter 2. After Peter talks about David being on, excuse me, Peter talking about Jesus being on, being on David's throne in verse number 30, 33. Therefore, being by the right, no, yeah, 33, no, yeah, 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So Jesus received the Spirit at conception, at baptism, and at his seating at the right hand of God, the Father anointed him three times just like David had been anointed three times. Now, as I said before, there's a connection between us and David. There's a connection between us and Judaism. Let me try to define that and break that down for you. I, I preached a sermon a few weeks ago. I listen uh, uh, fairly often to a Messianic Jew on the radio. He has a lot of great things to say when it comes to the culture and to of just practical things, I think he's very, very helpful. He classifies himself as a, uh, a Messianic Jew, and I hear that over and over again all, all through the years I've heard this, and I felt almost like I was being robbed. Like the Jews have this special relationship to Jesus as Messiah, so I decided I would preach a sermon called, I am a Messianic Gentile. Is there a problem with that? I don't think so. When we look at Romans 15, which we will do, he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. 
and in him shall the Gentiles trust. He's risen to reign over the Gentiles. That's you and I, if you're a Gentile. Anyway, I'm a Messianic Gentile. Romans 15, 12 states that. I'm circumcised by Christ without hands. Now, think of all these Judaistic terminologies, the language here. I have come to Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, 22. I'm a child to my mother Jerusalem from above, Galatians 4, 26, who keeps the feast of the Passover in unleavened bread, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. Enjoy the Sabbath rest, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. I'm a Jew inwardly, Romans 2, 28. I'm a child of Abraham, Galatians 3, 29. I'm a partaker in Israel's spiritual heritage, Romans eleven seventeen. I'm a member of the new Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16. I'm an inheritor of all the promises made in the Old Testament of the land, Matthew 5, 5, and the consummational glory, Ephesians 3, 21. I am built into the final temple of God, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. I'm a part of the tabernacle of David, Acts 2, 30, and Acts 15, 16, and 17. I enjoy the sure mercies of David, Acts 13, 14, and extol my Messiah reigning on the throne of David, which we read in Acts 2, 30. <clears throat> I live in my bodily temple, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, or 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and Christ reigns now over his enemies, Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. He intercedes as my merciful Melchizedek priest, Hebrews 7, 25. He speaks as a prophet to my heart, Acts 3, 23. I'm part of the holy Jerusalem that will be displayed at the end of time, Revelation 21, 10. I'm a part of the bride of Christ composed of Jews and Gentiles from the beginning of time, Revelation 21, 12, and 14. I'm a citizen of the royal priestly nation, 1 Peter 2, 9. I'm washed in the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, Hebrews 13, 25, which is currently realized in this current age, Hebrews 9, 11. We have to save together our spirit baptized in Jews relinquish their Judaism and Gentiles gain their Jewishness. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, and who's he writing to? The book of Corinthians, primarily Gentiles. He says, all our fathers passed under the cloud and through the sea, and we're all baptized unto Moses. Notice he says, our fathers, a plural pronoun there, inclusive of Gentile believers who now can look back at Old Testament believers and see that connectedness that we have with them, that communion of life with those, especially the regenerated ones primarily. When I went to Jerusalem a couple of years ago, I went to a church and I had opportunity to uh, go out with a couple that were involved in the ministry of that church, kind of a younger couple, and uh, the gal had been uh, in, born in Jerusalem, lived there all her life, and 13 years prior to that, the Lord saved her. She trusted Christ, the Lord saved her, brought her into the faith. Well, her family for five years abandoned her. They had no communications with her whatsoever. But after five years, finally things started to break down, and she was telling me how at least her family is embracing her to some degree. And so I asked her about how she goes about doing evangelism. I said, what kind of a track would be good to give out as a Jew who was born in this city trying to reach fellow Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What's the best thing to give out? You know what she said? Very wise and so true, I amen her to death. She said, I give out the New Testament. That's the best. That's the interpretation of the old. I heard a, a rabbi on the radio <clears throat> last week. He called in this radio program, and he said that Christianity has mistaken many Old Testament passages the way they interpret them in the new. And that's a fact from their standpoint. They'd have to believe that because they reject Christ in the gospel. 
and they don't see that the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, and that is a key hermeneutical tool that we all use, and it's very necessary. You've probably heard the expression over and over again, a lot of the TV evangelists about supporting Israel and blessing Israel. Bless those who God has blessed and God is going to curse those who, who, who uh, curses the people of God. And it's, it's all Israel. I call it israel all a tree. It's a really a idolizing of Israel. And unfortunately, I think in some circles, there's more praise to Israel than there is to Christ by believers. They've exalted the Jews in, in Israel above the scriptures. Even Paul says that you ought not to think of me above that which is written. We might think that the Jews are a monolithic people. When we say, oh, the Jews are going to be converted, many ethnic Jews, or send money to Israel, support the Jews, and so on, you would get the impression that there's a unification of the Jews. But I want to show you some things about, and I think this will be important, it's not exactly related to our topic, but I thought I would squeeze this in because I think it would be important for you to understand this. It was to me at least. The population of Jews in America is 6.7 million. That's the total. 4.2 of them are religious Jews. The remainder are secular Jews or they are part of a mixed marriage parents. 10% out of all of them, only 10% of them, are Orthodox Jews. And I think oftentimes when Christians refer to the Jews in supporting Israel, in the back of their minds, they're thinking of the religious Jews and primarily the Orthodox Jews. Do you know that the Jews are divided about Israel themselves? And when you say supporting Israel, who is going to receive the funds? Who are you going to send them to? Christians in Israel? You're going to send it to the Netanyahu? Are you going to send it to some charitable organization, to, to their Sanhedrin, uh, the Knesset, I think they call it that? Where is the money going to be funneled? Scripture says, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 and verse uh, 10. 25% of Jews between the ages of 18 and 29 say that the United States is so, too supportive of Israel. There are actually four different camps of Jews in America that go from one end of the spectrum to the other end. One end believes that they ought to be supportive of Israel. They're highly, highly Zionistic. And even though there's large amounts of money that are raised every year by the Jews for Israel that are not necessarily Zionistic who are sending over the money. And for your information, the amount of money that is raised that's sent over to Israel by the Jews is $1 billion a year. $1 billion a year. As I said, the other extreme, and I want to show you a picture if they can put it up on the screen, just so you get an idea what's on the other end of the spectrum, so that you can deduce like I can from these statistics and many more, that they are not a monolithic people. Hopefully we can get that up in a second. Um, it really highlights, I think, these two extremes. And while we're waiting for that to show up, the biggest location of Jewish population in America is where? The Big Apple, that's right. Where there's about 1.8 million Jews in New York City. The biggest place of population in all the world is Tel Aviv. And in Tel Aviv, they have the second biggest gay parade in the world. The second biggest. Primarily the Jews that are doing this there, 2.5 million. And even Orthodox Jews are going there and in some terrorist fashion are opposing it. And in their rebellion against them, they're actually trying to kill some of their fellow Jews. The Orthodox Jews call Tel Aviv the city of sin. 
Here's another group. These are ultra-Orthodox Jews who participate in a, a parade that's held every year in New York City. I believe it's Fifth Avenue. I was there a couple years ago uh, to observe it because I have a couple of children that live in Manhattan. So I strolled over there to watch this. And this is one of the uh, groups, all Jews, who are holding up these banners. Now, I don't know if you can read them. I have them written down here somewhere, what they say. Uh, these, th it reads like this, one of them, I think beginning at the left, it says, authentic rabbis always oppose Zionism and the state of Israel. You wouldn't expect that coming from a Jew to describe J Judaism or the Jews in Israel, I should say. The second sign says, Jews mourn 65 years existence of Israel. And these are rabbis carrying the signs, ultra-Orthodox Jewish rabbis. And the third so sign says, Judaism con condemns the state of Israel and its atrocities. Talk about division. There you go, from one end to the other. And in between, you have all other factions, not to mention that you have ultra-Orthodox Jews, you've got Orthodox Jews, you've got Reformed Jews, you've got conservative Jews, and then you've got the secular Jews. So we're not talking about a monolithic people when we talk about the Jews or those that are in Israel even, as far as having one mindset. Although I'm not denying the fact of what has already been said. All Israel shall be saved, that there will be a community of Jews that will be converted at the end. I'm not in any way trying to dispute that or doubt that whatsoever. My perspective is that modern Israel is apostate, John 1.11 and 844. There's no difference, uh, they're no different than any other Gentile nation, Romans 3.22. They're cut out from the olive tree, Romans 11. They're removed from the kingdom, Matthew 21, 43. They're guilt stained with the blood of Christ, Matthew 27, 25. They're still at enmity with God and despise the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 16. They have no scriptural authority to claim exclusive possession of the land, Joshua 21 and 1 Kings chapter 4. And don't believe that the present temple building plans are a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. We are the end time temple of God's. As to Israel being restored as a nation, I believe Israel will be grafted back into the olive tree, but not as a corporate body of people, but as individual persons like Paul said, and like he exemplified, God has not cast away his people who he foreknew, Romans 11, 1 and 2. The people who fo he foreknew, though, are the remnant, the individual elect persons of the Jews who were predestined, Romans 8.30, and gathered into the new covenant, Hebrews 8.8 8 and following, and composing with fellow elect Gentiles, Christ believers, etc., the new Israel of God. The Jerusalem that is from above is our mother and should be our concern, while the Jerusalem from below... Then, after historically rejecting Jesus, and at this moment in time, modern-day Israel is in bondage. Jerusalem is in bondage with her children, it tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 4. Acts chapter 2, going back to there for a second. The throne of God. Excuse me, the throne of David. Jesus is sitting on the throne of David. Peter is profiling Jesus if he's th on the throne of David, he's being profiled as a king. He uses similar language in the fifth chapter, 31 and 32. It says, the God of our fathers hath exalted him. Hath raised up Jesus. In, let me get that verse exactly. Acts 5, 32. The God of our fathers has raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God hath given to them that obo obey him. God has made him to be what? A prince and a savior. That prince, I be believe the usage that Peter is using there for prince is similar to his referring to Jesus sitting on the throne of David now as king. So Jesus 
is king right now, Peter tells us that in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter is preaching, again, after the healing of the man that sat at the gate called Beautiful, Peter says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, so that your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he goes on to say, Whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. And from Samuel and onwards, all the prophets spoke of this day. And he goes on to say in verse 30, 23, he says, Every soul which will not hear what that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So Jesus is not only a king on the throne, but he's a prophet on the throne. And then, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's, Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin seems to be a fulfillment of what Jesus said to the high priest. Hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. Which reminds you of what? He's saying Daniel 7 verse 13 and 14 are going to be fulfilled. Here's the hereafter. The hereafter is in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is speaking. And he says he breaks in at a certain point when they're gnashing upon him with their teeth. He looks up into heaven and he says, I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What's that all about? Daniel 7, 13, 14. One like the Son of Man came before who? The Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and kingdom and glory that all nations and people and so on should worship him. What, what is Stephen profiling him like there? If Peter is profiling him in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 5, as king on the throne, and in the third chapter, he's profiling Jesus as being prophet on the throne. What is Stephen referring to here? I think Stephen is profiling Jesus as the high priest on the throne. Keep in mind that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. When Jesus says to the high priest, who was definitely a Sadducee, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power on high. It's through the eyes of Stephen that that prophecy was being fulfilled. Is that very high priest before whom Jesus was standing is the very high priest that Stephen is speaking to, and he's saying, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. Thank you. I told you that in advance. Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man. Now the posture of Jesus is unique. We always, rightfully so, think of Jesus as sitting at the right hand of God. He finished the work, praise the Lord, it's over with. Now, son, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So why do we have a posture of Jesus standing? Well, the most popular view is he was standing to receive Stephen. I think that's very sentimental. I have no problem with that, although I don't think that that's the right answer. Another possibility, and this is one that I held for a long time, up till maybe today, was this. <laughs> that's the benefit of coming to Tennessee to this conference. Uh, you have to search the scriptures to be sure what you're saying is accurate. Well, anyway, what I did help hold was from Psalm 94... It says, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Psalm 94, 16. Stephen sees Jesus standing. What is Jesus doing? He's applauding. He's supporting. He's encouraging Stephen. And Jesus is seeing, I mean, Stephen is seeing Jesus standing, and that's motivational for him. That's seeing one who's standing on his behalf, supportive of him. I think there's something to that as well. But I would like to suggest to you, Jesus is standing. In Hebrews it says, every high priest standeth daily ministering. 
Jesus is ministering to Stephen as a high priest. So we got Jesus at the right hand of God as a king, Acts 2, Acts 5. We have Jesus at the right hand of God as prophet in Acts chapter 3. And now we have Jesus as high priest in Acts chapter 7. I think that's wonderful. Prophet, priest, and king Jesus is right now. You know, there's some groups out there, Pentecostals primarily, that I know of. I actually saw pictures of, of them in a magazine and looked it up even. This is exactly what they do. They call this maybe, it's going to sound really bizarre, so get ready. I'm glad you're sitting down because this is as bizarre as it comes. But they call this grave sucking. What they do is they, they're going to graveyards of, like Amy Semple McPherson would be one, or Catherine Kuhlman. Um, and on and on, the list of those kinds of persons, believers, born-again people, Pentecostals namely, are going to these sites where their tombs are, and they're actually stretching their bodies out upon them so that they can draw the anointing that was once on them, on, on their predecessors, the ones that died, so that they can receive it for themselves. They're going to the dead for an anointing when God has raised up his son to his own right hand, and we're told to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Where do we draw our energy? Where are we getting our spiritual unction? The Jerusalem from above is our mother, our mother. And if King David... Our Lord Jesus Christ is in the Jerusalem that is above, and Jerusalem above is classified as our mother. Where ought we to go to draw this spiritual unction, this energy? It says in Colossians 2.19, holding the head from which all the body by joints and marrows, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. We're supposed to draw from him our great high priest, our king, and our prophet so that we can live a life that is to his glory. His name is Jesus Christ the Lord. The name Jesus would stand for his humanity. The name Christ would stand for his dignity. And the name Lord would stand for his deity. We have his humanity, his dignity, and his deity all in that one person, the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. When I was in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, a number of years ago, I was sort of taken up with the Western Wall and how many flocked to the Western Wall. It's sort of like, at, at certain periods of the day and, and times, it's almost like halftime at a baseball b game. All the men run to the restroom, you know. It's like a mad rush to go to the restroom. Well, they're just pouring in, coming down, and they go right to the Western Wall. And I, I was wondering, what are they praying? And one of the prayers that they're praying is this. Thanking God this way, saying, I thank you, God, that I was not born a Gentile. That's what they're praying, among other prayers, but that's one of the prayers. Our prayer should be, God, I thank you that I wasn't born once. Can you say amen? You know what I mean. We've been born again. Because if you're only born one, once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. Praise God, we've been born again. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. That's what we have as those who believe on our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see him not in the tomb, not on the cross. We see him ascended into heaven. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And that's what our brother Tony was talking about. But in the meantime, during the session, the sessional period, while Jesus is waiting, waiting for the moment when the Father will say, Arise, my son. Go retrieve the bride. Sit though now here until I make your enemies your footstool. And once that is done, the Father will give the command and the Lord Jesus will return. 
in the meantime we're in a sta- meantime we're in a state where we can look unto Jesus we can behold him we can see him we can draw from him we can recognize that he is king on the throne he is reigning from heaven above he's reigning Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies. When is that taking place? The next verse in Psalm 110 too says that he shall reign in the midst of his enemies. That's taking place right now. Luke 19. The enemies say, we will not have this man to reign over us. There's almost a subtle recognition that Jesus' reign is being proposed to them and to everybody. So when we preach, it's vital that we preach the lordship of Jesus Christ. When we're talking about the lordship of Christ, we're talking about his kingly reign. God has crowned him with glory and honor. Seated at the most majestic, glorified place possible in the universe. And given a name which is above every name. So that that name... Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is what? That he is Lord. You know, sometimes we're so worried about getting people saved that we sometimes dilute the message and we can get easily discouraged thinking, well, nobody's getting saved from the message. No one's receiving the invitation to come to faith in Christ, to repent of their sins and trust him. But A.W. Pink put it this way, and I like it. It It always comes back on me. That the gospel is not merely an invitation, but a declaration. So we're declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. Going back to my prayer in the uh, town hall, we pray all these things in the one who is the King of Kings, in Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. That's who we pray to. That's who we believe on, King of kings and Lord of lords. Right now, the world don't, doesn't see it. Even our life is hid with Christ in God. We should be bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And one way that we can do that is by having that constant gaze on the King of glory in beholding the Lamb of God on the cross, recognizing that God honored his Son and gave him a place and a name above every name that is in all of the universe. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We praise him for his humanity, we praise him for his dignity, and we praise him for his deity. We're Jews inwardly. David's important to us. I want to have a king reigning over me. I don't want to have myself reigning over me, and I don't want to have any other man reigning over me. I want to have the man that's sitting at the right hand of God. There was a priest one time, he went, he was going through the uh, hospital rooms and asking different people if, if uh, they would like him to pray for them, and he went into this particular room of a Christian, and he said to the, uh, the patient, he said, would you like me to pray for you and you can confess your sins to me? And he says, give me your hand. And the priest gave him his hand, and he's feeling his hand. He says, I don't, I don't feel the scars in the hands. My finger's not going inside the hole. Thank you, but no thank you. I've got one who died in my room instead, and my sins are washed in his blood. <laughs> That's a good note to close, and it's after 9 o'clock. Let's bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, O God, for demonstrating to us who were once aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. We thank you, Lord, that as Mephibosheth, we've been brought now to the table of the great king and can dine with Jesus, uh, King David, and have that wonderful invitation and communion with himself. Oh, Lord, we give you praise and worship for him. We ask, oh, God, that our love for him would grow more and more. That as we think of uh, what a great Savior he is, what a great Lord, what a great King, oh, God, we're indebted. And we are unworthy that we should ever be called the sons of God. We marvel at the love that's been demonstrated towards us. We just give you praise as we magnify your grace 
and thank you for showing to us that Jesus Christ was our Savior, bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. We thank you that we can look to the victory that Jesus has accomplished as he's seated now at your right hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we recognize you as our king, as our prophet, and as our great high priest. Receive our praise and thanks, almighty God, in the worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.